Hi everybody. Uh, so this video is to walk you guys through Hills Like White Elephants by Hemingway. Um, most of my lectures you'll see are facing me, but this one I wanted to make sure that you guys could really see the text. Um, so this story was written by Ernest Hemingway, who was one of the last generation. Um, he was an expat living in Paris after World War II. He was in the war. He saw a lot of horrors, a lot of um, degradation of human spirit, and he, like many writers of the era, were disillusioned with the state of humanity. Um, so they lived in Paris, and they lived a very um, artistic, bohemian lifestyle. Um, they drank a lot, they partied a lot, they were all friends, they were in the salon together. Um, you know him with the likes of, of uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein and Zelda Fitzgerald. Um, and Hemingway's style is very unique. There is no one who writes quite like him. It's much along a journalistic style, so it's very much this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And a lot of times he'll leave out a lot of uh, details to kind of let you formulate those details in your mind. Um, and this story is very unique in that he actually uses a lot of dialogue to convey what's happening. And you as the reader are not always clear on what's being said. Um, you really have to read between the lines to understand what the, the subject matter is of this story. So um, if we start um, at the beginning, you'll see that there's two travelers. They're Americans, young, a man and a woman, and they're um, uh, at a at literal crossroads. They're at a railroad station waiting on the train to Madrid in Spain. And you see that there's a lot of symbolism literally from the get-go. Um, they are at a crossroads where physically and also metaphorically in their relationship. Um, and you see that they're relatively ambiguous as characters. The girl does have a name in the story, the man does not. Um, but for a, a long time at the beginning of the story, it's just back and forth dialogue between the two. Um, and we have a lot of sort of frivolous discussion that has a little bit of a deeper meaning. Um, so you see the two kind of go back and forth about having a, a glass of beer at Cerveza. And you see that the man speaks Spanish and the girl doesn't. Um, this is unique because she is an outsider in this culture. She is entirely dependent on the man to, to communicate, to travel, to understand what's happening. So you get a, an interesting gender dynamic that's kind of planted at the beginning of the story. Um, and you see here where she says that we, we see these, these glasses of beer brought and um, you see this, this sort of expansion of the hillside and the countryside right here. Um, so they're looking at the white sun and the brown dry hills, There's a lot of um, juxtaposition. And the girl says they look like white elephants. Um, and that is the first sort of interesting moment where we have this idea put forth of white elephants. So um, if you think of the, the phrase white elephant, we think of not only Christmas, we also think of elephant in the room. Um, and that is exactly what's happening here. We have these two who are having this whole conversation around an idea, but they're never actually saying what they're trying to say. So um, they kind of continue on, and she says that, um, you know, they, they keep talking about having these different drinks. And um, she's like, let's try this drink, let's try this drink. And you see that. This is kind of the topic of their conversation, the depth of their conversation. It's very um, surface level. There's no deep motion. There's no um, deep discussion of, of politics or religion or, or anything beyond just what are we going to drink here today. So you get this kind of sense that they live this traveler's uh, expat lifestyle that was so popular at the time, um, which is really um, a gilded cage, essentially. So, as they continue talking, you see that she depends on him. Um, her name is Jig, and she depends on him because she keeps asking about this drink or that drink or what should I do, and should I have water with it, should I not? And then she, she brings up a topic which basically instigates a fight between the two of them. She says it tastes like licorice, and she says especially all the things you waited for so long, like absinthe. And he says, oh, cut it out. And she says, you started it. I was being amused. I was having a fine time. So she's essentially instigating the argument. It's something that clearly is bothering her that she wants to talk about, but they don't ever actually talk about it. Um, 
So she correlates the white elephants to the white elephant hills, essentially to this discussion. So we again get this indication that there's an elephant in the room, that there's something they're not really saying. Um, and she says, isn't that all we do? Look at things and try new drinks? So she's kind of bored of this lifestyle and she realizes that it's, it's not the fantastic romantic lifestyle that they thought it was. Um, so they're really foreigners in a strange land, they're outside of their element, and they're not even connecting with one another. So there's this theme of isolation throughout. Um, and she says that um, the elephants, uh, they don't really like white elephants, she meant just the coloring of the skin through the trees. But when she talks about these hills, um, if you think about white hills in the distance, it's something that could be reminiscent of essentially a woman's pregnant belly. It's a symbol um, that could represent something like that. So we kind of move into this discussion of directly of what the real discussion is about. So he says it's really an awfully simple operation jig. He says it's not really an operation at all. And this is the first time that we understand that they're not just talking about the hills. They're talking about something a little bit more deeply. Um, and as we talk, we, as they talk, you start to understand that what they're talking about is abortion. He says it's perfectly natural. Um, I'll, everything will be just like it was before. Um, it's not a big deal. I've known lots of people who have done it. So the idea of this abortion and this operation, um, you see a yearning to go back to the past. We keep saying we'll be just like we were before. And they repeat this, um, this phrase over and over again. And the idea of we'll be just like we were before literally is a, is a representation of their desire to return to the past. It's also representative of this larger idea of what it is to return to the past for the expats in, in Paris during this time. They can't return to the past. No matter how much they try, um, the world has crumbled around them. There's nothing they can do to go back to this time of innocence and freedom. Um, and so... They continue to have this, this argument without ever actually saying it outright. And dialogue is key here, is how we understand what they're, what they're actually talking about. Um, so he keeps saying, we've known lots of people who've done it, and she sort of mockingly says, and afterwards they were all so happy. And, he's, and he continues to try and pretend like it's really her decision. Because um, he's saying, you don't have to if you don't want to. I wouldn't have to do it if, I, if you didn't want to. Um, but, and then he keeps pressing her and saying, but I know it's perfectly simple. And you see her kind of return the volley to him. And she finally starts to, to question his motives and his, his feelings towards her based on what he wants. Um, so she says, you don't actually care about me because if he did, he wouldn't be pressing her to do something that she didn't want to do. And she kind of gets fed up and um, she basically says... I need you to, to stop talking. And he doesn't listen. He says, um, apologies, let me move down here. Um, she says, can we maybe stop talking? And then he's the one that continues to talk. So he actually breaks the silence that she's looking for. And again, presses something that she doesn't want to talk about, literally makes her do something she doesn't want to do. Um, and he says, I would do anything for you. I would do anything for you. And then she says, would you please, 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 please stop talking? This is the, the moment where we see the shift in the gender dynamics, where she's finally able to stand up and say, I need you to stop doing this. Um, and it's kind of a moment where we see this interesting discussion kind of come to a close. And what's unique about this is during this time period, open discussions of a topic like abortion were, were taboo. Um, so post-war, you start seeing this development of, of sexual freedom and other types of freedoms that you didn't have societally before the war. And part of that is in how gender norms um, kind of function and how different genders relate to one another. So you see here that the woman actually is getting a voice, and it's interesting that she's the only one that is named in the story. So she actually has more representation than the man in this story. Um, and so at this point, she realizes that there's really nothing that they're going to agree on. Um, so she finally says, if you don't stop talking, I'll scream. And the only thing that stops it is the foreigner, the foreign person intervening and 
kind of coming back into the picture. So it's taking them out of their, their realm and back into sort of um, this, this, this world where they have these niceties and this false image that they have to present to the world. Um, and so the, she smiles brightly at the lady and they pick up their bags. And um, at the end, she says, he says, do you feel better? And she says, I feel fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. So again, we go back to this sort of false reality of pretending everything is okay when it's not. And that's really what the lost generation was, was about, was that they often had a lot of um, social and pol political and economic and philosophical issues that they were addressing. Um, and they were sort of absolving their, their pain from the war with all of these sort of false um, escapes drugs and and alcohol and and, and other forms of, of self-indulgence um, so that really is what Hills Like White Elephants is about so I hope you guys enjoyed it um, it offers a really interesting cultural context that a lot of other stories don't and it's something that you really have to pay attention to and read very closely to kind of understand what is happening